Welcome back to Buckeye Talk. I'm Stephen Means. That's Nathan Barrett, and that's Andrew Gillis. And we thought spring break meant we got to take a break from the breaking news and the craziness that has been Ohio State's offseason. And then Tony Offer decided to throw a wrench in that. More importantly, Michigan decided to throw a wrench in that. Michigan obviously parted ways with their running back coach, Mike Hart, after this year as Sharon Moore continues to put together his first coaching staff as the Wolverines head coach. And the reports came out on Wednesday that they are expected to hire Tony Alford. Ohio State's running back coach as their new run game coordinator, running back coach. Tony Alford has been at Ohio State since 2015. Obviously, the first things that come to mind are he had the last year of Ezekiel Elliott. He recruited and coached J.K. Dobbins into a second-round pick. He's the reason Travion Henderson was at Ohio State, plus plenty of other things. Nathan, I guess on the list of things that has happened to Ohio State, not to Ohio State, that has happened in the Ohio State football realm over the last three months, where does this fit in the hierarchy of things you, of, in terms of least expected things you were thinking about? Well, hi, but it's mostly because of the timing. Like, you wouldn't necessarily expect this to happen a week into spring practice. It doesn't surprise me that Tony Alford is leaving. And it was, we had talked about that when we did a, a pod a few weeks ago about staff longevity and things like that. He's been here nine years. It's not often that guys stay somewhere for nine years where they're sort of locked into just being a position coach. And no matter what other titles they put on it, that really is what he's locked into at for the most part here. He's not going to be a coordinator at any point. It doesn't seem like no matter how long he stays here. Brian Hartline already haven't been promoted over him for that. So that part doesn't surprise me. If he had left in the offseason, it wouldn't have surprised me. But the combination of a weekend, the spring practice, and the fact that it's Michigan. So this is an unprecedented. Guys have left one rival for the other before. Ryan Day's first staff, people probably remember, had Al Washington as linebacker's coach. Greg Madison as a co-defensive coordinator, both hired off of Michigan's 2018 staff. So it's not unprecedented by any means. It's been a long time since Ohio State lost someone to Michigan. I, I don't even know that off the top of my head, but people who are more tenured would know that. Um, but it, so that in itself has some some shock value um, to lose anybody to Michigan and to lose it at this juncture of the rivalry where Ohio State, so much of its identity right now is built in this effort to uh, get back to Michigan's level. And now you've got a guy who's been here for almost a decade and it's a, a smart business decision on his part for a number of reasons we can get into, but it's still going to feel personal. And it already does. You can see the reaction from the players at Ohio state like this, this feels personal to them when somebody leaves for Michigan, especially after you've already started preparing for the season where you're trying to beat them. So Andrew, from the player's perspective, obviously, Ohio State, in terms of what the room looked like, this was arguably maybe the best running back room in the country, at least the top two when you got Trayvon Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins. Both of those guys signed up to play for Tony Offer. Dallin Hayden signed up to play for Tony Offer. And then you got James Peoples and Sam Williams-Dixon at the bottom of that room as true freshmen who signed up to play for Tony Offer. It doesn't necessarily change anything from a pro- personnel standpoint at least i don't think it is well do you think actually because there is a spring window transfer window that is going to open up and if you think that you've got five guys in this room who all signed up to play for a guy who you went on vacation for a week and you're coming back and he's not coaching you anymore how does that impact ohio state's running back room going forward with that second window opening up after the spring football well, I think it, it it definitely maybe impacts the younger guys more than it does some of the older guys. You know, Travion Henderson's been here a while. I mean, he's been in a situation where, look, he, he came back to win a national championship, to do the things that he hasn't accomplished. You, you've We've talked about that ad nauseum of all of the guys that kind of came back, especially from that 2021 class. You're not worried about really, I, don't, I wouldn't say Quinshawn Judkins. I think that you feel pretty good about those guys. Where my attention would kind of go is, how does Dallin Hayden feel about this? Because, you know, Dallin Hayden, you're talking about a situation where you were on the red shirt plan last year. I know we all have <laughs> thoughts about what that red shirt plan was and whether it was merited or whether it was worth it or not. Uh, how does he feel about this? Because the guy who kind of put him on that path is is now gone. And how does James Peoples feel about this? Because, you know, we talked a lot about this where, where Peoples was maybe setting up to be you know, the starting running back or in a one-two punch with Dallin Hayden in the 2025 season, 
as you know the leaders of Ohio State's backfield. And now the guy that recruited you is gone. I mean, James Peoples is from Texas. It's not like they got they went and got him from Cleveland or from you know Cincinnati right down the road. And this was a school that you know he always had dreamed of going to. Right? He he's not an Ohio kid. Like that's a big deal. He's not Sam Williams Dixon, who's from right down the road. You know, like this is a this is a notable thing to me. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm more curious to see how the younger players feel about it and to hear about how the younger players feel about it, because those are the guys they are going to have to be here a while, you know, Trevon Henderson and, and Quinshawn Judkins, they came here for, you know, pretty specific purposes. They wanted to do everything that I said at the beginning, you know, boost their draft stock, win champ, win championships, conference and national championship. Like those things are kind of set, but the guys who are going to have to be here a while, I think that those are the guys where my attention turned to pretty immediately. So, but I think in order to have this sort of conversation, we probably should just go ahead and talk about why Tony Alford is leaving. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people may remember in February, Ohio State announced several contract extensions for assistant coaches. Did not announce one for Tony Alford. So he's a lame duck for 2024. And really, I guess the whole staff sort of is at this stage, right? Like if if things Mm -hmm. go really wrong in 2024, everybody's gone anyway. To go somewhere now, even if it's a lateral move, even if it's not that much more money, I assume gets you a two or three year contract at the new place. You now have more job security. You're you're able to lock yourself in for the short term. It, it goes back to what I was saying before to where it just really seemed like Tony Alford was probably at his, I, I think I said it in the text, like you're just out of runway. Like this happens in jobs all the time. Like, you've gone as far as you can go. You've plateaued at that employer. And that really feels like what Tony Alford had done here. And he's got aspirations to do more than that in his career, I believe. He has interviewed to be a head coach before. He has been in those discussions, not at Ohio State, but at at other places. And the idea of taking this and, like, locking yourself in for a couple of years of security as opposed to looking at a future where a year from now you might be sort of casting about for whatever job is out there you get to control your destiny a little bit more here and michigan's a good place to land sorry to say i know that that's i know that that's not the uh uh, from the objective um or the subjective view of ohio state fans i know that's not true but from just a football fan football standpoint it's true so that's the thing that you have to remember as we look at what the repercussions are across the rest of this roster because all of those things about why Tony Alford recruited those players to Ohio State in the first place remains true. The interesting one that you brought up is is Hayden. And I can't say here and say that I have a great read on the Down Hayden Tony Alford relationship and how that has played into his usage over the last couple of years. Um we've tried to get a read on that through Ryan Day. And because Ryan Day at times has been like, oh, yeah, we've definitely got to get him more involved. And then he isn't. And at the end of the day, that is Tony Alford's decision. So I'm I'm not trying to uh, that's there's some speculation there on my part. I just don't know if that's um, I don't know what how that relationship is right now. So um, but that's I, I think it's important to kind of make sure that we're putting Alford's departure in the right context that it and I even wrote a piece for our site that essentially said, like, it's it's a business move for him. But it feels personal because of who it is and when he's doing it. The Dallin Hayden one is interesting. He also comes from a football family. So from the standpoint of the business side of this, Aaron Hayden, his father played running back at Tennessee, and I think he was a professional for a couple of years. I think Dallin gets that part of it, and he's always gotten that part of it because this is also not the first time that Tony Alford has flirted with leaving a Ohio State. Now, this one actually got somewhere, but when you come from that type of background where you've been around it, you've seen it, you've got parents who can understand it a little bit more, you can be frustrated. You know, Nathan, you just mentioned there are guys all over Twitter right now and all over Instagram who are a little frustrated with this. Obviously, nobody from the running back room has said anything because that's the smart thing to do is not say anything when it's the guy who's directly responsible for your room. But some of the people have been a little bit more vocal about this, but I think Dallin Hayden was in an interesting spot. Anyway, coming out of this spring when they brought in Quinchon Judkins and it was very clear he was going to be third, but is it going to be third the way it felt like Mayan Williams was third last year where it still was a role or is it third where it's 
a significant drop off in between what Quinshawn and Travion Henderson get and then what Dallin Hayden would, would get. Now that you're bringing in a new coach, that dynamic is even more interesting. Does Dallin Hayden or anybody else on this roster want to get out ahead of things, especially those bottom three guys, especially those freshmen as well, because they're just starting their careers. Do they maybe decide to go in the portal? And th- these are the type of conversations you have to have now when you have coaches three days into your spring break decide to go on decide to leave your program one more thing i want to get into before we take a break here and dive deeper into this nathan obviously this is probably a surprise to ryan day just as much as it is to everybody else here this is all happening very quickly here so i I, this would be maybe grasping at straws and there's probably not a lot of merit to it right now as we're all trying to figure out what's going on here but we've seen ryan day hire from within we've seen him go outside and higher there, but he's really never had to do it to this significance in replacing an offensive member of his staff because the only other time he's had to do that where it wasn't was when Greg Shajawa decided to walk, when they separated ways and you went and found Justin Fry, who you had a previous relationship with. And then when Kevin Wilson left and you just picked up a GA and you gave him a job, you've got, excuse me, Chip Kelly on your staff as well in this situation, and maybe there's an influence of where they decide to go with this running back position in terms of who's coaching it. How should Ryan Day handle who he decides to go after to who he decides to go after to be his next running backs coach, and how quickly does he need to maybe resolve this issue this spring? So obviously they're on spring break this week, and other teams are starting spring football, but some of them haven't started yet. Mm-hmm. I, so I, this is not a panic situation. Like you lost a position coach. And you lost it in the spring, but you lost it at a position where you have a four-year starter about to be, a transfer coming in who is also one of the best running backs in the country, a three-year guy below him. Like You've got some stability in that room already. So it's not a panic situation. Plus, on top of all that, you do have Chip Kelly, who's just come in, and knows a thing or two about running backs. There are some options here. It doesn't sound like Ryan Day would want to hire a quarterback. It sounds like he wants his play caller to be the quarterback's coach Mm -hmm. from the way he talked. So I wouldn't think he would go that direction. If you set aside just the idea of hiring another running backs coach, uh, another option would be, and I floated this in a text, I think this is just, I'm not saying this is likely, it's more to just speculation on my part. Keenan Bailey has been involved with like every position group at some point or another. If you think he would be a good running backs coach, and you think it would be easier to hire a tight ends coach um, that you'd like, that that you want, then I guess they could go that route too. I'm a little skeptical they would do that, though. I think he, he's in a good position. It's an important year for that room that he's already been working with. And I think that position group also maybe gives him some additional flexibility to be involved with some other things in the offense, lets him be in the booth and on game days in a way that maybe even a running backs coach wouldn't. So I'm just throwing it out there. I don't think that's the way they would go. But I, on the running back side, I, I you've got your pick, don't you? I mean, you are – it's Ohio State. You've got those two running backs at the top of your room. And you've got Chip Kelly calling plays for your offense, who, by the way, has had some pretty good running games over the course of his career. Like, who wouldn't want to be the running backs coach at Ohio State right now, except maybe Tony Alford? Like, wouldn't everybody in the country want to be the running backs coach at Ohio State right now? If, like, I think you have your pick. I think you can go out and and take whoever you want. Now, I mentioned in some of the texts that I sent out what Tony Alford was making. I think it was like 772000 And I, yeah. I made a point about that in relation to the rest of the staff. That other guys were getting promotions and things that were pushing them past a million, and Tony Alford wasn't, and I don't think it was going to get to that point for him until the scale had like completely changed. But he actually, I think, from what I could tell from the the, uh, USA Today assistant coach database, was the highest paid running backs coach in the Big Ten. So that tells you you're probably going to be able to go out and and at the same price hire pretty much whoever you want. Um, If you think there is a young guy and I know people are going to bring up names that are associated with Ohio State. I saw that Tim May very quickly I guess got in touch with Eddie George and Eddie George was like, "No, I'm not I'm not down for that." Mm-hmm. But um Pepe Pearson who is the um um running backs coach for Eddie George at Tennessee State, that's a name that would be more interesting. 
But I also think like any discussion we've had about assistant coaches and yes, fit is important and, and someone who culturally fits on your staff, whatever. I just think this is a case where uh, you're limited only by your imagination. Really? If you're Ryan day, like who do you covet? Make them say no. And then just start working your way down the list. It, you've got time. It's early in spring. It's not a season. This isn't like 2020 where you had, you know, um, Master Teague and then he gets hurt. And you don't have Trey Sermon yet. And you're kind of looking around like, who are the running backs in this room? And in some of the other situations they've had where it just felt thin, uh, it's it's kind of robust right now. I, I, so you don't have to like do a hurry higher, in my opinion. I think they can take their time and make a big splash and hire uh, someone of Tony Alford's esteem or better. I wonder what DeMarco Murray's relationship is like with Ryan Day and Chip Kelly. Because his year with the Eagles in 2015, the head coach was Chip Kelly and the quarterback coach that year was Ryan Day. I'm just like, we're just floating it. This is happening in real time. So this is, no, I'm not telling you insider information. I just know DeMarco Murray is currently at Oklahoma as a running backs coach and has been there since 2020. And he's done a pretty solid job there. And I'm just trying to, you know, you're always looking for connections, especially when you're talking about a head coach who's only in year five. So it's not like he has this large Rolodex of coaches he can call on, right? He's still building those relationships, building that up. It's not. You know, Urban Meyer, who had been a head coach for 20, 25 years by the time he's not 25 years, but such a long time by the time he got to Ohio State that he could just pull a name out of a hat. Andrew, we're not going to get a chance to be in there for a practice until March 30th. That's the next time we're in there. Maybe some more get at it. Maybe they don't. But that's what, 15, 16 days from now as we're recording this pod. So if Ryan Day doesn't have this decision made in the next two weeks, which I don't think is crazy, and I also don't think it's, to Nathan's point, a panic mode if this isn't done in the next 14 days, if he's literally starting this process at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday as he's finding you – know, he probably found out quicker than we did, but still, he's, this is – developing information here pretty sure he did yes. yeah <laughs> but it's not it's not like he found out two months ago right he probably found out within like the last 48 hours just like we are finding out if we were in there for a tuesday practice how much more would you expect to see ryan day just hanging around the running backs in comparison to maybe some other positions simply because that spot doesn't have a coach right now and it would be getting run by qcs and gas well, I think you, you kind of have to be, right? I mean, you don't want a position run by QCs and GAs, although when you look at Trayvon Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins and Dallin Hayden, guys who have been here a while, maybe mm. if there was a position on this roster that could be run by QCs and GAs, you'd probably put running back towards the top end of that list, right? Um, so, you know, maybe That's Ryan Day could... What yeah. position do yeah. we what think positions can you coach themselves? To run it and it would still p- produce a productive product come the fall? So, I, I yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, maybe you see Ryan Day help out a little bit more. Um, you know, you obviously want to be speedy with this um, because I'm we're going to talk about recruiting, I'm sure, in the next segment. Um, you know, but there's there's visits happening over these next couple of weeks with some running backs that are going to come in. There's There's guys that are maybe not rec- uh, making their official commitments, but you got to know, like you, you got to know sooner rather than later, you can't let this drag out for, for weeks and weeks on end. And I, I don't think Ohio state will. So, you know, I think in the short term you can kind of patchwork it up. And if you have to, you know, you know, skimp by for a couple of practices, practices, that's, that's not the biggest you know thing in the world, but yeah, I, I think Ryan day will be there and um, you know, kind of helping out a little bit more with, with the QCs and the GAs, but, I don't think that it would be a long-term situation to where we're sitting there going, oh man, like it's been going on now and we're at the spring game. They still don't have a running back. So like, I don't think we're going to get to that point. So I think if you have to do it, it's going to be very minimal. And and I think also they can help. Other guys can help out. Like I was saying before about Keenan Bailey, like they have uh, in Sean Banks, a a GA in the tight end room that they, they've always really respected somebody who could, take on some more of that while well, if Bailey has to help out more with the running backs temporarily, like there's, there's in day himself, Kelly, you know, day can do more with the quarterbacks and Kelly can help with the running backs. Like they, they've got, they, they have some layers here of um, where they've, they can, they can, um, I'm trying to think, I'm scrambling for the word, um, but the, they, they, they cover each other's backs a little bit here. 
some redundancies. They have some redundancies on the staff. That's the word I was looking for. So we're going to continue to talk about this on our Buckeye Talk podcast. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube, go listen to Buckeye Talk wherever you find podcasts, and you'll get the rest of this. But for now, we're going to take a quick break right here, and we'll come back, and we'll get into some of the other places where the loss of Tony Offord impacts Ohio State. That includes recruiting, but then also look at what the Tony Offord era at Ohio State has looked like over the past decade and the roller coaster that has been the, his time here in Columbus here on Buckeye Talk. 